Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hall from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and we're looking at the night sky at the moment. Now, um, hello. unfortunately uh, Kay is not with us this morning, she's been taken off to do some other important work, but I do have that other bloke with me at the moment. The uh, other bloke? Yeah, the other bloke. Yeah, that's me, <laughs> Keith Osborne. That's Keith, yeah, and he might be putting a bit of music on for us a little bit later on. Okay, so let's just have a look at what we've got in our night sky, but it's something that we should remember first of all, uh, daylight saving, uh, starting next uh, uh, Sunday, next weekend, all right? and clocks go forward an hour, that's on the Sunday the 24th and uh, incidentally the, for those of you look at the picture there that's actually a photograph of the Earth uh, taken from the International Space Station and look at that thin band of light, it's actually sunset looking at sunset from the International Space Station mm. but that thin band of, of air there which makes life possible here on planet Earth yeah. It's amazing when you think of that It's you know, we think of the air as just being everywhere, but it's actually just this very, it's almost like the skin on an apple. It's just a that, thin that, layer, that's yeah. How, that's how yeah. thin it really is. And that's is. a matter between yes. life and death, and yes. between a world like the moon and the world like the earth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, looking in the evening after, because uh, normally it takes about an hour, hour and a half for the twilight to completely disappear so around about 7 30 p.m the sky should be really dark and looking to the south uh, we see the southern cross there uh, laying on its side remember the southern cross from new zealand never sets but its position continually changes and you identify the southern cross by the two pointer stars that follow it around the sky and of course the brighter the two pointer stars is alpha santawi which is the nearest star beyond the solar system. Yeah. Well, leaving things on a little bit later, all right, by midnight, the Southern Cross will be moving to its lowest point in the sky. So that's the sky that we're gonna be seeing round about midnight. So, and what we're looking at here is, is really the, the real division between uh, summer and winter in our sky. So looking yes. up, okay, there we looking to the west, we've got the scorpion, which is setting in the west. Now the scorpion is our sign of winter. While it's winter and cold, the scorpion's in the sky. By midnight, it's going to be disappearing into the west. So that's a scorpion there. And then to the east, we've got Orion. And Orion is our summer sign, all right? <laughs> Again, when Orion is in the sky, it's summer. So yes. we've got the two changing places at the moment. Of course, if you lived in the Northern Hemisphere, it would be diametrically opposite. Because I remember I grew up in England and, and Orion was always so, always marked by cold and frigid winter, months. Yes. Yeah, that's and right. And I, of course, uh, I grew up in New Zealand, in a, in a real country, in the Southern Hemisphere, where all the best countries are. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's the other way around. Um, Orion has always been the summer, summer constellation. Yeah. yeah. And um, I always think of the scorpion chasing Orion, the hunter, That's around, right. the, around the sky, right. because there's a myth, um, uh, there's a famous story told about scorpion, uh, about Orion, who claimed he was the greatest hunter, and he could hunt and kill any animal, and Hera, the queen of the gods, um, she, uh, out of spite, made the scorpion, and the scorpion stung Orion and killed him, and Orion was... The um, I think was it the fates who lifted Orion up into the sky, uh, where we see him now, and they put him safely on the opposite of the sky to the scorpion. So the two chase each other around the sky, but the scorpion can never get Orion. Yeah, there's, a, there's other slightly different v versions of that. Yeah, yeah. But the whole yeah. point of the, those ancient stories is they're telling you what's actually happening. Yeah. And so one is chasing the other, you know, one yes. is sort of uh, exactly 180 degrees away from That's the other right, one. Yes. Yeah, as it goes around the sky. Right. Yeah. So those are the two signs. And the Orion's easily recognisable. We'll be looking at Orion in more detail. The same with the scorpion, all right? Anyway, so we, as we then turn around and look towards the north, all right, uh, the Milky Way is getting low in the sky because during the winter, of course, we had the brilliant Milky Way was directly overhead. Now it's beginning to head towards the horizon. And um, looking up there, 
Directly north, we have what is known as the Great Square. It's made up by second magnitude stars, but because it's in an area of the sky well away from the Milky Way, it's really obvious. So that's the Great Square that you can see there, watching this on TV. And of course, the other important object that's rising up here is Matariki. Matariki, yes. Yeah. The Matariki rose up in the dawn in the winter, but now as we're getting into our evening skies of midnight, it's rising up round about midnight there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's Matariki there. Now, and we are looking near at Matariki is a big bright star in the sky. You can't miss it, but it's not a star at all. It's actually a planet. And of course, our, to our ancestors, planets were also stars. They were planet means a wandering star, yes. right? That is in fact the giant planet Jupiter, right? Yes, which is an absolutely awesome object in the sky. It. You, it's more massive than all the other planets put together. And mm. it's the only planet in the sky which actually radiates more energy than it receives from the sun. Right? Yes. Yeah. Now, this is um, partly because of gravitational contraction. Mm. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yes. It radiates a huge amount of... Uh, it generates... Um, I, I'm interested in radio astronomy. And Jupiter is very a very strong radio source. You can actually pick up Jupiter radiations, uh, the uh, radio waves from Jupiter, using nothing more than an elaborate TV er area. Yeah, I, look, i tell you what, mate, yeah. it's a pretty deadly planet. Uh, yes. This is what they discovered, <laughs> a scary thing, is that, yeah. that the, the, the emissions from it, the radio eruptions, and can, can destroy all the electronics on board a ship. And, of course, if yes. there were people on board, it could destroy your electronics as well. You know? Exactly, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the thing with Jupiter's radio transmissions, um, Nikola Tesla claimed that uh, he, uh, Nikola Tesla, who was an um, early 20th century um, uh, inventor, uh, rival of uh, Edison and all that sort of thing, but at one stage he designed a better form of radio receiver. And this radio receiver, he claimed, was picking up intelligent signals from Mars. Is that right? <laughs> it turned out, they think, what he was actually listening to were radio emissions from Jupiter. Right, yeah. Yes. Um, that, that's, that's what he's picking up. Folks, that is we're not powerful. saying there's intelligent yeah. beings on the <laughs> Jupiter. No, no. Actually, Jupiter is far more like the sun than it is the planet. Yeah. Exactly. There's no solid right. surface there. Right? Yeah. It just gets yeah. denser and denser, and eventually the hydrogen e helium turns into a, a liquid ocean and so on. But uh, yes. we'll look at Jupiter more in d detail in a, a later program. Yes. But Jupiter's not alone in the sky. Looking now back to the Great Square, if we go at... at Running angles towards the, the southwest, we see another brightish star in the sky, right? And that is, in fact, the planet Saturn. Saturn, yes. Right? And of course, it's a magnificent object. So, in the sky, we have got the two biggest planets in the solar system, both of which we call gas giants because they're yes. remarkably different to a planet like the Earth. But each of those two worlds is surrounded by a massive worlds, moons, or planets. Right? Yes. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think Saturn's got something like 96 moons we've now discovered. Yes. And Jupiter's got a similar number. Yeah. Yeah. Jupiter has over 60, I think it's over 60 moons um, known to us mm. now. The number keeps on growing. That's right. Because yes. a lot of these have been discovered, of course, with uh, things like the web telescope or observing them or spacecraft going yeah. out there and so on. So we've got these big, two big bright planets in the sky, we, both of which are absolutely magnificent even in a, uh, a small telescope. Okay, now the only other really bright object in the sky there, in the stars, is, is the star Altair. Uh, dead easy to pick, it's in the northwest, and um, it's, it has a star to either side of it. And also, I always find an interesting story, it's actually one of our neighbours, all right? And there, that, that's a picture of what it might look like, all right, from Altair. Its distance is just 17 light years. I say just, it's that small on cosmic scales, it's a long way yes, away to a, us. <laughs> yeah. 17 light years is still a long way. Yeah. Long way down to the dairy. But well, one of the things, while yes. we're interested in Altair, it's, it's, it is a, a white star. It's 11 times brighter than the sun, but it's rotating very rapidly, all right, at a rate of 210 kilometres per second. The entire star rotates in nine hours, all right? 
That's it incredible when you uh, think of it. The, well, the yes. sun takes 28 days, and it's yes. small. The sun's a lot smaller yes. all right, than this star. And in fact, it's getting close to disintegration point. Yeah. If it was too much, if it was rotating much further, it'd actually disintegrate because of centrifugal force. <clears throat> Fl flinging, flinging the star apart. Yeah, yes. but the other yes. interesting thing is that they discovered, this is with the Webb telescope and so on, looking at the, uh, analysing the, the star itself, is the age of it, 100 million years. Now, I know you might think 100 million years is pretty ancient, but for a star, mm. it's a baby. <laughs> and indeed, planets in orbit around this star will still be in the process of forming and that's in this uh, image I put together here is that's what we see all right if you imagine the earth when it was a hundred million years old it would be uh, hotter than what you see there yes. at the moment yeah, yeah. and where, where does it come from well it appears that all, not too far from Altair there's a big dark cosmic cloud and what's happened is that this is um, obviously stars have been formed in there and uh, Altair has been ejected out of this dark cloud. The dark cloud is not particularly noticeable unless you look at it on a, on a, on a photograph, you know. So yeah. that's one of the nearby stars. And of course, we believe also our sun was rotating quite fast when it was first formed, but slowly as in that disk around it in which the planets are formed, uh, that disk itself gradually slowed the rotation of it down. So right? creation of that yeah. uh, circumsolar disk it slowed the, rot the sun's rotation down to its present rate. Yeah, that's yes. right. Yeah. yeah, that's what and we believe. the yeah. sun takes, what, 25 days now to rotate on its axis. That's right, Is yeah, that right? yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. that's right. <clears throat> so that's, that's what you would see there. So n not a good place to uh, visit, but on the other hand, r really interesting to us that we have a, a star so close to us, we can analyse it, uh, that is very, very young. It gives us more clues on the origin of our mm. particular star. Anyway, uh, so that's some of the brightest things in our sky at the moment. But what I wanted to talk about next after that, and there's Altair just loving another look at it where it is there. What we're going to have a talk about next is meteors. And before ah, we do that, our yes. good friend over here is going to play us a meteor tune. <laughs> well, I've got my flute here. Um, I had a bit of trouble with this flute. It wasn't playing for a while, so I had to take it apart completely and uh, redo all the tiny little screws that hold it together. And I think it's playing now. Yep, there it goes. Well, meteors, right? Um, we call, most people call these things shooting stars, which we see across the sky. And again, that's something that our ancestors thought they were, small stars which were shooting around. And if looking at this photograph, for, for those of you watching this on TV, actually just to below and to the right of the meteor, which is flashing through, uh, is actually the constellation of Orion. And the yeah. orientation of the line, it tells me immediately this photograph's been taken in the northern hemisphere. Right? Yep. Because yep. The, the sword of the line is below the belt, the three belt stars you can see there, standing perfectly upright. But of course in our part of the world it would be the opposite way around. It's down. the other way around. Yes. But yes. meteors are actually just pieces of debris which have swept into the Earth's atmosphere and they burn up as mm. they come in. And the, while they might look spectacular, the average meteor shooting star you see in the sky it's probably not much bigger than a, a, a grain of sand for, so for example if you had a meteor piece of debris like a piece of rock the size of my fist coming in 
it would momentarily turn the night sky into broad daylight as it burned up. That's amazing when yeah. you think of it. Yes, yeah. it's, it's just the heat of um, coming in through the atmosphere, and it just heats it up to white heat. Yeah quite hot in conditions. Yeah. yes. Now you always see more meteors at your shooting star after midnight. And the reason for that is, that when we remember our planet is moving all the time, it's rotating on its axis, mm. right? And d during the early evening, the only meteors you will see are those that are moving faster than the Earth, overtake the Earth and strike it from behind. But as the Earth gradually turns around after midnight, we're more or less, when we look into the sky, we're facing the direction the Earth is travelling in space. Yes. And so as things are swept up, we see them. You're always going to see more of those meteors at yes. certain times. Yeah. After midnight. After midnight. Yes. And as you get in, into early hours of the morning, you'll gradually see more and more uh, wonderful meteors shooting through. Okay. Mm. Now, Are there meteor seasons? Are there time, times for different different types of meteor shower? Well, you've got the, what we call sporadic meteors, which no one knows are coming through but every now and again we get what we call a meteor shower yeah all right and we see a whole host of meteors occurring at a certain period of time right and this these meteors are due to the objects called comets right comets are mm. objects from the outer regions of the solar system the kuiper belt and they've been, they've been dislodged from there for one reason or another and as they orbit around the sun as they comet gets close to the sun the sun's energy begins to vaporize its outer layers which are all ice so it begins to glow and then yes. it forms a tail and the tail is actually material it's just been blasted off of the comet by the, the solar wind of the sun by the pressure from the sun yeah yes. so the, the yes. tail of a comet always points away from the sun right always no matter which way you're looking, it's always pointing away from the sun. <laughs> but what's happening is debris is being left behind there mm. in that field, right? Yes. And uh, so as the, as the um, comet tr travels around in its new orbit, it leaves a, a, a path of debris there. Then when the Earth comes along, every what, the same time each year, it, it intercepts it that, intersects debris, like, that path of debris. And you yeah. get this, this uh, meteor shower. But yes. the important thing is that they all appear to come from the same spot in the sky. Yes. And often you'll find a, a meteor shower's name from the constellation it appears from, like the Perseid meteors, yes. all come from the Perseids. Or the Perseids. Orionids or the Leonids That's or, right, yeah. or whatever. They, come, they appear to come from that particular constellation. That's right, yeah. Right, yeah. Yes. So yeah. throughout the year there's different, there's different meteors and meteor showers, and some of them can be absolutely spectacular at a certain time, where you, you see uh, dozens and dozens of meteors coming yes. through at the same time, yeah. yeah years ago I remember uh, being outside after midnight, uh, during the peak of the Orionids, the Orion meteors, and it was literally like, uh, oh, there goes another one. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. Yeah, it was literally like that. They were just, you know, coming thick and fast. It was, it was absolutely. It was so that, yeah. and uh, well, <clears throat> yeah. So if you know when these meteor showers are, is to get up early in the morning yeah. and see them uh, get out of bed early yeah. and see them because it is a spectacular thing. As as Keith is just saying there that you know the meteors come fa fast and sometimes you can see so many there's a, several meteors in the sky at the same time as yes. they're coming through yes yeah. yeah however one of the reasons why I was going to talk about it some of you may have seen this in the recent television uh, sorry recent radio and newspapers um, there's about a comet um, and the comets always named after often their uh, the discoverer, so Halley's Comet is named after Halley who discovered it. This is Wurtanin, <laughs> okay? And this comet, it's not a particularly bright comet. In fact, uh, you can, you can, when it was closest to the Earth, it could just be seen with the unaided eye. But it yes. was certainly, uh, most people, unless they're astronomer, wouldn't even notice it there. And that was in, it passed us in December uh, 2018. And then it wandered off out into the solar system then, all right? But... It ended up uh, both in 1974 and, and in 1980, it passed quite close to Jupiter. And the powerful gravitational pull of Jupiter, which we were talking about earlier, managed to rip material from this comet yeah. and blast it towards the Earth. 
Yeah, so Jupiter actually steered the comet towards uh, towards the well, Earth. No, it wasn't as a comet, but it's actually the material it it, it ripped off. Yeah. It's it's now fired gravity gravitational uh, 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 gravity of Jupiter has fired this material, and so it would be the Earth is actually going to intercept it, right? Yes. And um, so what will happen is. When this material arrives, we'll bump into it and we will get not just a, a possibly a meteor shower, but what some astronomers call a meteor storm. The sky will be lit up with meteors as they come through. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's, a lot of this is guesswork, folks, right? Yes. Because we all we know is this has happened. We, we're guessing just how much material is actually going to be has been sent towards and so. So mm. yeah, we might see a few meters. We could see a meteor storm, but it's going to be worth looking out for. And unlike most meteor t things which we see in the early hours of the morning, uh, this is going to. You've got plenty of time to get ready. This yeah. is going to happen on <laughs> December the twelfth, all right? Yes. And it's the 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 main piece that we're going to be intercepting will be between nine o'clock and midnight on December the twelfth. So, so all, yeah. all now, we've got to hope for is some clear skies. <laughs> yes, it's, I mean that's going to be really really spectacular when you think of it. A meteor storm. I've never seen one myself, mm -hmm. but um, this you know as you say, the sky is going to be just lit up with these meteors and the and the meteor trails and that. Yeah. yeah, now that comet, is that the one that they uh, affectionately call the Green Comet? It possibly could be. I know there's yes. a comet, it's a, uh, yeah. Yes. You've got to always remember when you talk about Green Comets or Blue Comets, uh, these are always images taken from space telescopes. Yes. Right? And they see colours that we don't see because there's not enough light coming through. Yeah. You see, I think I've mentioned this probably several times before. Our eyes have um, um, two different cells in them: uh, rods yes. and cones. The rods and, and cones. cones. Yes. Yeah, yes. and the rods give us black and white vision, but it's, they're very sensitive. The cones give us colour. Yes. So at night, that's why all the colours in the garden disappear because the cones are really shut down. And you're losing rods. Yes. To see yeah. it. All right? Now exactly the same thing applies to the stars. There's invariably not enough light coming from a star to trigger the cone cells. Yes. So you're seeing the night sky in black and white most of the time. Yes. Look through a telescope, and because there's more light coming through a telescope, suddenly, hey, that star's a red star. Or it's so triggering the, uh, it triggers the, 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 the colour sensing yeah. cone That's cells right. in the retina. And you'll find exactly yeah. the same thing if, if you, there was enough light coming from a, or it came close enough, a comet yeah. came close enough, you would see that there were different colours, yeah. which invariably were related to the elements that are there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there you are. So that's something to... Oh, look, we'll, we'll keep you informed about these things, folks, as, as we go along, as we know. Anyway, just to say that as far as Stonehenge is concerned, at the moment we're open from Wednesday through to Sunday from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. In other words, we're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, except for private bookings. And private bookings include a guided tours for people who want storytelling about the ancient the ancient knowledge and history of stone circles from and this is always very worth going to <laughs> well, uh, to, 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 hear, to hear Richard talking Richard I have to say is an absolute mine of information when it comes well, to I'll tell you thing. what it's but most of all is, is uh, you can see the feet of where I am now in that picture the, the zodiac down there when people come out there and discover they're not the zodiac sign they thought they were <laughs> Some of them panic, but anyway, that's yes. another story altogether. <laughs> exactly. So yes, yes, we have got uh, that that coming up. So that they can, they have to be booked. The guided tours have to be booked. Just phone us up. And the other thing, of course, is we're doing now is Star Trek. So if you'd like to uh, follow through on some of the things we've been, Keith and I have been talking about, come out there. And what we can do is we we take you through the night sky, picking out those stars and that out there at the moment that you yes. can see. I, I use a laser to cut that. That's a Star Trek, but again, that has to be booked. Of course, the only thing I can't organise, folks, is the, the sky. Weather. The weather. <laughs> yes. You just keep your fingers. Yeah, we we did one the other night, and uh, it was wonderful because the weather didn't look good. People had booked into it, and then suddenly it was. View is perfectly clear. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that was a, that was a night that I got a good uh, view of Saturn actually yeah. through my yeah. um, uh, Bresa telescope. But the sky, yeah. the sky didn't get as as um, 
dark as it should have done on the Milky Way wasn't as brilliant as well because I, what I didn't realise, I go, why is the sky not getting darker? There was an aurora taking place as well. There had been an outburst from the sun and there was yes, an aurora taking yes. place. So, now, yeah. at some stage, at, uh, very quickly at Stonehenge, I'm going to be giving a talk on the sun, on solar astrophysics, the way that the sun works. And this includes the eerie glowing lights that we call the southern lights or the aurora. When you see them in their yes. fall, they're absolutely yes. awesome. That's I remember incredible. Se yes. being seen, yeah. seeing yeah. one one night came coming back and suddenly these lights began to appear <laughs> huge curtains of color flashing yes. it lasted for all five minutes and then disappeared yes. so if I had I not been out there at that time I would have seen them you know exactly yeah yes so, so something special to think about yeah okay so let's start it and of course the other important event we've got coming up which again is next weekend uh, on Saturday the 23rd is the time of the spring equinox occurs then and it, on that day which is the equinox we're going to have a special presentation starting at five o'clock and you will hopefully if the sky is clear you'll be able to see the sun set over the hillstone and I'm going to be telling you all the wonderful stories of what the equinox the spring equinox was all about yes right? and that's what we're that's what we're planning to do now if you'd like to come to the spring equinox uh, just give us a, a call uh, Stonehenge a call and book it book your place in all right I know we've already got quite a few people coming so yeah so hopefully it's going to be a great evening storytelling sunset storytelling the ancient stories which are going to surprise some of you <laughs> and possibly a little bit of music too that's right yeah yes. yeah we're hoping to <laughs> we're hoping for all these things and then maybe you'll have a look at the stars as well with the music yeah yes anyway having said that uh we're just about finished for the night did you want to we've got two minutes left so did you want to play us some or just want to yes um well as i said uh i'll be I will be uh, giving a talk at some stage uh, over the summer on um, on the sun. Yeah, that's going to be uh, if all works if it all works out well. It's going to be a series of talks on um, on, on astrophysics yeah. and that sort of thing. Well, the thing is also to yeah. to have, go into the Stonehenge website and anything like this that's coming up. Whether it's talk I'm doing or Keith's doing a talk, Kay's doing a talk, it will be on that uh, web page. On the web page, yeah. yeah, exactly. So check out the web page. You, you can always find out the latest. Mm -hmm. 